there. Let's uh, look real quick. We got Uncle Al. We got Josh Connor. That's about it. Welcome, you two. <laughs> anyway, I wanted to, before I start, uh, I don't know of any of you guys that might know. Uh, there's another channel out there called Step One Survival. I don't know if you guys have heard of that or not. Yep. He it is uh, one of the larger channels in the prepping, bushcrafting stuff. Anyway, he uh, he collapsed tonight, and they took him to the hospital. So, well, yeah, uh, you guys could put him in your prayers. I'd really appreciate that. Oh wow! Well, Staff Sergeant BA, what happened to him? Uh, the, I don't know other than that. I got a text message on it, and he collapsed. But he's been having some problems before. A couple of weeks ago, he he uh, wasn't feeling too good, and he just went to the hospital, and they been testing him and stuff. So hopefully, it'll be under control. Well, hopefully, uh, since Sippy Cup's a nurse now, she'll help him out. Yeah, I hope she was there when it happened. That's what I, I know. Right? But yeah, I just wanted to That's make so that good. announcement and let everybody uh, say prayers for him. Man, wow! Uh, he's a, he's sort of like my mentor when I first started on YouTube. He helped me out a lot. Him and I would email each other and text back and forth, and we just uh, became really good friends. He's a good so, guy. Yeah. He's a Marine, so obviously, I I got his back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, fishing with Elyon. How are you? How are you doing? Welcome to the uh, stream. See, so you just walked in. Tonight's uh, discussion is going to be about transportation uh, in SHTF. We're going to talk about different ways that we could start uh, motivating around. Uh, we could start talking, let's talk something about maybe starting out with maybe diesel vehicles, veg powered vehicles, stuff like that. See what everybody thinks about that. I know that a lot of uh, diesel powered uh, vehicles can be switched over to veg and, and pushed back the other way, both ways, so. Bio, biodiesel. Biodiesel, yep. I uh, watched I watched some videos on that, and I read a little bit about it. So that's pretty easy, just to put a little switch in your in your engine, so it'll run either way. Well, the only thing with that is you have to change your, your fuel lines and where you store it, the the fuel, because um, the biodiesel it being an ethanol based is corrosive, and a lot of the older vehicles that are meant to run on that um, that water attracting uh, corrosion factor is will actually eat the rubber line so you need a stainless steel braided line fuel line to handle that and uh, once you do that then you'll be you'll be good to go but if you can do the newer vehicle the newer diesels the computer system's probably going to stop a lot of stuff but the older ones <laughs> yeah That's the older right. with the older thing about it yeah you'd have to pick your vehicle to do that too they're saying that probably the older vehicles would be better you could always change them over to the steel lines and but the older vehicles have that wider engine compartment, you know, where you can actually get in there and change things out and switch everything around. Yeah, well, all well, you do we is don't have a whole out. lot of them around here, but you can find them somewhat easily enough. But those old uh, Mercedes, the smaller car diesel engines they did back in the, you know, the. the the 80s or so those are really really good engines to have to be able to convert over to all those different alternative fuels you know i know a couple of guys that uh you know that run the junkyards around or you know out and about where i've been uh doing business over the years and they have cars that run on atf fluid they have cars that run on old transmission fluid they have cars that run on you know on biodiesel stuff and it's it's all and how you just I guess set up the I'm I, I'm by no means a diesel mechanic but I've seen plenty of alternate fuel vehicle you know the, the guy that had the the car running on ATF fluid and and trans fluid there he would go to all the mechanic shops in the area and, and, and get their used transmission fluid and then he ran a junkyard so every car that came through had you know six or seven quarts of transmission fluid in it you just crack that open and store it and you know it, it so you can get creative because that all you know transmission fluid is essentially you know diesel fuel with with at, at some sort of refined level right there um, it's got so so that's definitely a good thing to to if you were to want to build some sort of you know 
end of the world car like that, you know, you would want to get one of those older diesel engines there. As for one of my friends did, he got one of those old uh, uh, Volkswagen rabbits. Mm-hmm. <laughs> he just made it where it would run either way. And he would, you'd see him running all over town, uh, uh, going to all the restaurants and talking to them and getting all their used uh, fryer oil. And you'd see him pulling his trailer through town and just having like five gallon jugs of uh, of fryer oil on there. And then he'd take it and store it in his garage and he'd use it to convert into all of his cars while he was working on it so that he could test it and stuff. And he said he tried everything, but he said that that old fryer oil was working the best for him. Yeah, that stuff definitely, uh, it definitely works if you have the right engine for it, like the old rabbits for sure. The ones I know for a fact work great are the old Nissan, Datsun, and Isuzu diesels. Those things love biodiesel. So if you ever get a, you know, run across one of those and that's what your, your idea is, <coughs> I change out that rubber fuel line to a stainless line. And you should still have a, an aluminum line running from your tank. As long as it doesn't have that rubber baffle in the tank, uh, you're good to go. So biodiesel, yeah. absolutely. Almost comes down to the deal where we were talking about when you make your group, make sure you got an engineer and a mechanic uh, so that they can uh, go out and you got your scroungers going out there and getting all the junk cars and bringing them back so they can build one massive veg car or something. <laughs> sort of like a Mad Max scenario. Huh? <laughs> well, that's, that's me because I'm a, I'm a master tech by trade. I've been working on cars for 15 years, so I got all that stuff. Okay. Yeah, that was, go ahead, Cheryl. Josh Connor is talking about gasifier. Mm-hmm. It uses wood to ignite uh, g- gases from burning wood. Yep. There's a lot of pre combustibles in your uh, wood, especially hardwoods, and you're basically using those combustibles to power something. Oh, yeah. I Don't they make, uh, uh, you could use like uh, wood and something, making something like a car that ran like a locomotive right as long as you uh, stoked, stoked it with fuel and made it run on the steam right yeah that's a well, that's how, that's how you make wood gas or you know essentially uh-huh. methanol um is by vaporizing the the fumes that come off of the smoke of the hardwoods right there and then you uh you know catch that and distill it essentially you know condense it and uh and you you make your wood gas out of that so you know, yeah, definitely a gasifier is, is an excellent idea to be able to make fuel. Um, uh, a, as, as said, uh, oh gosh, it went so fast. Sorry. I mean, uh, biodiesel requires a different filter system and fuel stabilizer. Cooking oil is heavier than diesel. Um is that the same thing? Is he talking about the same thing, or is that something different? Oh yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it's it, biodiesel. And he says but... absolutely, the gasifier is also, you know, very dangerous for a car because, you know, it is a, uh, it definitely like a pressurized system right there, and it's it's pretty uh, combustible the, the the wood yeah. gas there. So, let's take a break. We got some new folks out there. We got Keith Cronk. How you doing, brother? Hey, Keith. Also, uh, Doctor Fish is out there. Uh, see, I saw some other ones. Kyle Anderson, uh, Jennifer Law. Hey, Jennifer, good to see you. Andrew O'Neill. Oh, there's the expert. There's Wes. And then Prep Ford's out there. I just want to make sure everybody got called out there. And Wes was saying something. Let me try to find. Wes was saying something about the diesels. Yeah. That's, he was saying biodiesel requires a different filter system, and it also requires fuel stabilizers. Or they would have to, I think there's a way that you have to uh, purify that cooking oil, isn't it? You have, don't you have to strain it several yeah. times? It's a whole process. You actually have to add, uh, like, lime or, yeah, lye to it like, lye, like to make soap. you got to add that to the cooking oil. It's, it's like a big stirring process, uh, multiple different tanks you got to put it into. I mean, it's a big deal. Like, it's not just put cooking oil in your vehicle and you're going to go. Yeah. Like, you have to make a chemical procedure to it, like actually measure the weight of that cooking oil to see if it's uh, 
within a certain parameter. If not, you got to add additives and remove things. And it's have a, you tried that, Wes? He's saying something here. Let me see. I'll get him up here where I can see it. Unless you're a zombie movie. <laughs> you want to come up here, Wes? <laughs> we better get him up here. Let me get a link for him. <laughs> Hold on, Wes. You can just pump on this link here, buddy. Cooking oil, no. There yeah, you go. You have to refine it. You have to refine all that oil you get. Yeah, my buddy, he said he had to like strain it several times to and add like I can't remember what kind of oil he used to to add to it to thin it out. Yeah, you have to. Not only do you have to strain all the part particulates out of it, so all the the you know material that was fried, but like I said, you had to add, you have to add lye and you have to stir it and like a magnetic stirrer to get the proper ratio you need add that to the mixture to convert all the fryer oil into like an like an alcohol base like an ethyl alcohol so it'll so turn to buy have it to actually have an engineer to do all that uh, well or somebody okay. that understands that, kind of thing. that process yeah hey alana alana just stepped in here you guys Hey, Alana. Yeah, I think it'd be easier, honestly, to make ethanol than it would be to make uh, biodiesel. Well, ethanol, there's uh, things you can make out of corn and stuff, right? Ethanol, is that ethanol? You can make ethanol out of corn, sugar, uh, help certain grasses now. You can make uh, ethanol out of it. The only thing that, that is kind of the main thing I don't like about it is it requires a lot of land because you're basically you can't use your food because obviously you're not going to eat your corn. You're going to be using it for fuel, and uh, it the the cost is a little bit high even yeah, now. Like, well, it yeah, costs more. I would be worried about the cost if it was SHTF. It'd probably be world without yeah, rule of law, so you'd be out scavenging that stuff up. Yeah, but you have to make a uh, basically the way same way you distill alcohol. You have to, to do that for. Uh, ethanol. So you'd be getting a big still, uh, put your mash in there, make sure you got your mash right, and then boom, you're making ethanol. That's all. That's all moonshine is, really, yeah. isn't it? Ethanol? That's what you're doing. You're making moonshine, yeah. <laughs> what would be another good way to have a vehicle made for it? Uncle Al seems to think we'll all be afoot. Well, you can try to make an improvised, like you were talking about earlier, an improvised steam engine where you're basically uh, heating up a boiler and then uh, using the, the steam power to move you. Uh, you could also look at electrical. I wish Reed was here for that because the uh, since he yeah, invented I electricity. The mad scientists would show up. Since, since he invented electricity, I'm sure he knows how to do all that car stuff. <laughs> with electric cars. Well, ah. ele electricity, like electrical vehicles, I think is going to be kind of an interesting idea. You know, and it's very much in its kind of infantile state as far as being able to be a reliable form of transport. But you're, you're starting to see electric skateboards, electric bicycles, electric scooter, you know, all that stuff is coming out and it's, it's not overly expensive. And, and it would, you know, if you can have a hardened unit that's going to be, you know, protected or unsusceptible to an EMP, if it happens, if that's your, uh, you know, idea of. Uh, your cataclysm, then uh, it'd be kind of nice to have something small and electric because they're quiet and you can move around. Superfly, what the heck is Superfly? Hello? What's up? West Superfly. He's in here, channel. but I don't... Well, I gotta fix my sound. I keep echoing into yeah, everybody's super stuff. <laughs> the superfly. What's with the superfly? <laughs> Is that something like uh, Iron Man? Jimmy Snooker problems. Um, Jimmy Fly Snooker, I guess. Lou's saying something about cold weather. 
Yeah. Cold weather. Weather. Some people use uh, heat exchangers, and that's to heat the oil to run run it. Is this? I'm trying to go back here. He said something else. Uh, um, let's see. He said. Uh, if you're running straight used cooking oil, you have to filter trash and water out, then start engine on diesel fuel. <clears throat> Run on oil, then before you shut down, you switch back to diesel to clear system. Well, I mean, uh, the original diesel engine was designed to run on farm waste oil, so. Oh, I mean, okay. Okay. That's I hear you. I, I'm reading what you said, old man. What what I do on the sheets? The blade can slide out a third of the way. Which, oh, you're talking on the end. Oh, okay. If yeah. you want to send that back, I can fix it. Okay. Then he also says during cold weather, some people use heat exchanger to heat oil to run to run heat oil to run with oil. Do you see that? Uh, uh, oh, I just lost it. Yeah, I see it. You see it? A45. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, I see it. Comes a third way out when you hold it. You're not supposed to hold it by the sheet. That's why I put it to snap on it so you can hold the handle, old man. But I can fix it if you send it back. Um, We're talking about the sheets I did for him. Lou says if you're running straight cooking oil, you have to filter the trash and water out. Yeah. Then start the engine on diesel fuel and then run the oil before you shut down. And that'll switch it back to diesel to clear the system. That's if you're running the used oil like the, what do they call it, uh, Biodiesel. Biodiesel. Well, they call it something when you harvest it from the the places. It's something or other proteins or whatever. It's their Waste. rotten Protein. grease and stuff. Uh, hog, hog fuel. Uh, but it's got basically it's got chicken fat in it. It's got baking grease. It's got cooking oil. It's got lard. It's got veg it's got everything in it. Oh, and it's that, like what I was talking it. about, yeah. my buddy getting all the stuff from the restaurants. They probably put all the oil into that one container. And uh, like if you get if you're getting it from several different places, you could have canola oil, corn oil, peanut oil, cottonseed oil, um, and it's That's not all we're talking about. about this. That's how my buddy did it. He just went around from, to the restaurants and got the five-gallon jugs that they ran all their oil off into, and that's what he used in his rabbit. Well, okay. and, uh, another thing to keep in mind, if it really has hit the fan and you don't see uh, infrastructure coming back, you know, all the, the power pole transformers uh, up on your little local power poles, those all have, what, 10 to 15 gallons of of mineral oil type of stuff, you know, pretty much diesel fuel in those as a, as the cooling agent. So, you know, you can always set up a catchment system and, and somehow uh, drain the, the electrical electrical transformers there to, uh, to acquire more fuel if needed. So please, please, however, make sure <laughs> that you know for a fact that it's permanent, that it is absolutely and nothing is coming back because elsewise you are nothing but adding to the problem every time you poke a hole in the bottom of one of those transformers to get to the oil you should ruin somebody's day sure <laughs> yeah because those take what like 18 to 24 months to replicate and get shipped out and get installed so you know the if you take out all the, the transformers on a on a short-term collapse it's going to take a hell of a lot longer to bring the system back up so you know they've got spare small ones sitting around but if you know you got a guy out there with a straw and a 22 harvesting motor oil yeah it's not gonna last forever yeah that's true that's for sure well and that's why you know that's why having the diesel or using the uh, the atf fluid would be good because you can go and 
crack the crank cases of all the or the the you know the transmission cases of all the cars that are stranded out on the, the roads there and and still be able to harvest some some oil so there should be a lot of junkyards left too to siphon out of a lot of abandoned vehicles i'm sure and it's that's uh people like oh blah blah this stuff there's another reason to have one of the old vehicles that's not injected a carbureted vehicle Mm -hmm. you can run naphtha in it, a, a gasoline engine. You can run naphtha in it. It's going to run like crap. And basically that's uh, your uh, that, the stuff you put on your uh, charcoal to get it going, you can okay. run yeah. when they're done that. Uh, it was an expensive way to get the vehicle to the gas station, but I made it. <laughs> <laughs> had to feed the carburetor afterwards, didn't you? I just put some more gas in it and ran with it. Um, but the guy was like, why does your sauce smell like uh, lighter fluid? I said, don't worry about it, man. It's <laughs> awesome. Well, I peed in the radiator before to get to the gas station. You do what you have to do, you know. Well, uh, I had the lighter fluid, and I would go out, and I'd fill the carburetor full, and then fill the uh, line at the, what do you call it, where the filter was, put it back together, start the truck, and drive till I ran out of gas, do it over again. I would make it about 30 miles. Okay. Luce, Lou has a comment here. It says there used to be, I'm assuming there used to be a couple of companies that made kits to run on waste cooking oil, separate tank for oil, switches and solenoids to switch from diesel to cooking oil. Yeah, but that's not a, an apocalyptic situation. I mean, that's something you do now to save money. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize that a lot of that, uh, the stuff that you have to that you get from the if you just get the stuff from the waste bin and try to run it in your car you're gonna have issues they actually uh, run an inline heater on that or an in tank heater to keep that warm the oil warm yeah I think somebody was mentioning that something about running a heater they were warm it up before it got to the ignition point. Yep. It has to, it, it has to, uh, <coughs> it has to go in and be able to expand. You don't want a glob of grease going in your, your engine. It has to go in. It has to be tiny little droplets. And then those have to come in and the piston comes up, compresses it to a point where it can't take it anymore. And it goes, bam. There's no parts for it. It works off of compression. It it's just like the. Uh, uh, that's for cooking oil. oil. And Cruiser Mac is saying uh, moonshine, but who wants to waste the moonshine on it? That's all. <laughs> that's all ethanol is. I mean, that's your uh, uh, your gut that alcohol they're putting in your car or whatever. Ethanol, yeah. And it's just uh, it's just moonshine. They're just raising the cost of bourbon. That's all they're doing. Yeah, just use the heads. You can't drink that anyway. Yeah, uh, and people can't. People always talk about alcohol. If um, even on the eighty-five percent fuel, the eighty-five percent ethanol, and it's fifteen percent gasoline and eighty-five percent ethanol, right? If yeah. you take and run your vehicle on gasoline, okay. That vehicle is going to get 20 miles to the gallon. If you run it on ethanol, it is going to get 10 miles to the gallon. Yep. Because ethanol has no cajones. They take the corn, they grind up all the other balls, and they give you the piss that's left. There's no, it's just like uh, the difference between propane and natural gas, which are two perfectly viable SHTF options. Nobody ever talks about it. There's going to be all these tanks of propane just sitting out there all over the place. If you've got the right stuff, you can thief your tank full forever. Propane will run in that any gasoline engine. If you've got the right attachment, you have to do nothing to the engine. You just change 
the thing that feeds your carburetor. That's it. On the valve the flip, It's a switch. It's literally you flick a switch from gasoline to propane. That's all you do. So what if we had like a two and a half ton truck? Would that work on something like that? It depends if it's a gasoline engine. If it's a gasoline engine, you can convert it to run on propane. So okay. uh, Josh brought up a point is if you're, let me get back up here. Uh, this is based on your vehicle is EMP proof. If it's an EMP event. And this is going to get everybody in the thing mad at me or whatever. But a lot of the EMP fears are based on old, old information. Uh, they have been studying the effects of EMPs on electronics, what causes them to be so effective, this, that, and everything else. Almost every, well, I want to be careful how I said it because I don't want to lie. A lot, a lot of the modern vehicles are what are considered to be EMP resistant, which the old vehicles that run off of points and stuff like that, they were not EMP proof. They were EMP resistant. That EMP could still blow your battery up. It could still melt your points. It could still blow the little uh, resistor looking thingy, whatever it is, that little capacitor in there that made your points okay. fire when they were supposed to fire. There's a hundred different things that could go wrong with the EMP on your vehicle. My Toyota is actually considered EMP resistant. They have everything isolated so that the vehicle, it doesn't act like a giant collector and fry and there's actually, it's actually designed so the non-essentials electronics will fry and cause an interruption in the current going through my vehicle, which will allow it to continue to run. If, you know, like my GPS might not work or my radio might not come on. My power windows might not work, but the car will start the fuel system will operate, the analog brakes and all that stuff will operate, the main computer will operate, and the vehicle will operate. It might not have automatic dimming headlights. They, I think I read something about that a while back, is where the, the cars are, are going to be EMP proof. The uh, You need to look for something either after... <sighs> 16 2016 or before uh 80 if you want the protection some of the ones that go back as far as 12 i think uh toyota and dodge go back as far as 12. but uh the dodges stuff there were ways you could bypass the safety of what an EMP would throw the safeties on it, and you could go out there, you could literally with the jumper bypass what was designed to blow. But that's not the same thing as being EMP resistant. It was it, it made it really easy to get the vehicle back to going after an event. It's not preventing it from going down. I think I read a deal where it said that the newer cars that uh, the the alternator. Is built differently now, so that if you an EMP hit, I, and I, I can't remember exactly how it said, so I'm probably going to be full of crap. But the alternator is built differently now, so if there's an EMP, that the car won't be immobile. That it'll still be able to run. Yeah, you see, like a. Uh, uh that was one of the. The things with the, even the older vehicles, like the older Fords and stuff, uh, in an EMP, they've got the big metal body, and the voltage regulator is grounded to the body through through the mounting screws or whatever. It's how it works. At them. I mean, it's how it does its thing. So you've got, even in that old vehicle, that the voltage regulator is going to get fried. Even if it starts and runs, your uh, alternator is not going to be charging your battery. So it's only going to run for a little bit. The, there, there's a lot of stuff out there that 
yeah, the older vehicles, you can get them back on the road quick. If you've got spare parts in your basement, they don't have to be in a Faraday cage. If there's not 20 miles of wire or uh, think about it, uh, in the old vehicles, you've got a steel body, steel frame, all that metal to collect that energy, which runs through the ground bill, back through the battery to wherever. It's got all that juice going through. The first point it gets to, that's where it fries out. The first place it has the arc, the points, the voltage regulator, the battery. But the beauty of the older system is you replace the voltage regulator, the points, the battery, and you're back on the road. That's why the older vehicles were better. I mean, you even in they even got it right in uh, the War of the Worlds with Tom Snooze. Is that his name? No, Chris. <laughs> uh, where the guy was like, "Oh, I can't get this to run." He said, "Well, try this," and he changed out the part, solenoid, the solenoid, and it, and it started. You know, the EMP took the vehicle out, but because they were able to replace the one part that it fried. That older minivan went, took off and ran. They actually got that part, other than the fact that the minivan was too new for that to have worked. But that's, uh, I mean, come on, there were aliens busting up out of the ground. We can't pick the movie apart too hard. So. You might have already, the grain of salt. You might have already answered this, but Lou is wanting to know if newer cars can be shut down by cyber attack. Yep. Yep. If you got OnStar or uh, Sirius Every Radio car. or on Smart the car. GPS, yeah, I mean, if you got GPS, if yeah, uh, yeah, if your car connects to the internet, yes, it's like those new electrical cars, they'll probably be able to shut those right down just by uh, using the internet or whatever they call it, cyber attack. Because those newer electric cars are all connected to the internet. Well, then don't forget your key. Your key and most of your newer vehicles uh, that, you know, when you get your key cut, it's no longer just getting your key cut. You got to get it programmed. Yep. Any yep. kind of PMP yep. that you may have uh, is going to fry your key and your car won't start. So. That's how my Jeep is already. I got a 14. I went to get it my just a duplicate of my key made. Even though I have a steel key, they wouldn't replace it because there's a chip inside the handle of it. That's right. And uh, <laughs> you got to figure a lot of these vehicles are now running on 25 to 35 computers at a time. So, uh, Oh, there's a lot more than that. They're like the the new Mercedes and BMWs have over over 250 computers in them. So I'm being they generous. Run on a shit group of computers now. So especially with the uh, Volkswagen, how I can't even pull a check engine light out of certain Volkswagens without changing out the radio to a factory unit. <laughs> I'll see you, Danny. Have a nice night. I saw you come in, buddy. Okay, uh, Uncle Al keeps talking about steam engines and steam. Talking about what? what? Steam engines. Steam <laughs> engines. Yeah. Dangerous yeah, high pressure, man. You better have that. you better have some solid tanks because that's a that's a pretty volatile. Um, that's why they stopped using steam engines is because it was pretty pretty volatile with the pressure. So. And there, there's a. Believe it or not, there is a subculture movement out there wanting steampunk and stuff like that to happen post SHTF. I mean, it, it's not going to happen. You can't have a flying steam train, people. <laughs> Are you talking about steampunk? Is that what yeah, you're talking about? Yeah, steampunk. Like, you know, <laughs> if you're going to do a gasifier to run your steam engine, you just like double the weight for nothing. Just burn the freaking wood that you're going to use to gasify the other wood to heat the water to start with. Yep. Uh, there's some, they're really cool ideas and like the giant robots and everything. I like, I mean, I think it's cool. I like, I love the art, but stop smoking that shit, people, because it's not going to work. I hear you. <laughs> Those steampunk guys, though, they do have some pretty cool stuff that they yeah, talk dude. about. 
I, I like the thing called androids. You, seriously, the android girls, they got the little dip pipes on the back. Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, way earlier, I think it was Josh brought up horses. Yes. Now, I think in his question, and it's way bit, quite a ways back, so I can't remember exactly, but uh, he kind of phrased it that uh, would it be too expensive? Um, I think it's where you're at. Here, it would be. <laughs> I mean, you know, let them loose in the field. <laughs> so, you know, I think it just depends. All depends on how much land you have, if you can feed them and uh, shoe them. Cause it's not just the feed. You got to worry about the shoes. And uh, I mean, back way back when everybody had a horse, multiple yeah. horses. Not that that's hard. A horse. I, agree. I mean, that's a, uh, I don't do horses anymore. Chip, I wish he was in here. He does horses and or he has done horses. There's a lot goes into horses. Bob Hansler does horses. There's me and him talking about this one thing, and I said, No, there's horses involved. I don't want to mess with horses. Horses are hard. They're each horse is the equivalent. Well, let's, to mow your grass, people, to mow your grass with a push mower, you need three and a half horses. Three and a half horses, huh? Three and a half horses to mow your grass. Oh, well, horses are expensive. Yeah. So, well, think about it. I mean, it's three and a half horsepower in that little lawnmower. That's just, it's literally, that's three and a half horses. The what your lawnmower can do, the three and a half horsepower that it has, that means that you need three and a half horses basically to do that much work. What that could do in it, however much grass you could mow in an eight hour day with that three and a half horsepower mower is how much grass you could mow in a day with three and a half horses. Yeah, so you have to get a Shetland pony is what Wes is trying to say. You want any Shetland pony? Three horses and a, and a Shetland pony. Uh, to uh, run one swather, one swather, the, you see them around in the horse drawn swather was 20 horses. They, you see them on TV, they got, Two horses hooked up to this machine. It could move the machine, but it could so, and then, drive and then that to, machine all day long. You know, and then to reliably move the stagecoach, you were talking, you know, eight horses. Eight horses. You know, on a stage and they coach. only had to the eight horses only had to move that stagecoach like five or six miles. Yeah, stagecoach was full of people. They would literally pull the stagecoach up to a point. They would have horses already set that they would they would just unhook the whole team, move them out of the way, back the other team up there, and hook them on to the stagecoach. And the stagecoach would take off after you know they take 35, 40 minutes to switch out the horses, and then boom. An average team of horses hooked to a uh, uh, coach. Well, no, I was trying to remember the name of the freaking machine. We have one at uh, Fluvanna that I go over there and I look at. I'm like, this is so cool. Um, but it took 40 mules to drag that thing through the field. And uh, now you can you can move it around and operate it with uh, a 60 horsepower tractor, though, <laughs> which I think is pretty cool. I mean, that's a little bitty tractor. Yeah. It's a little tiny tractor, but you can run this giant freaking machine. This thing is, uh, it's every bit as long as a, a 18 wheeler, but it's mostly just air, but it's got, uh, it's a baler. It was a baler. It's a big baler. It, they could drag it through the field, the swather, they run the swather, and then they'd run the rake. And then they take this thing and drag it through there, and it would literally, with horsepower, no tractor part or nothing, pick up the hay, run it through the machine, pack it into a square bale, and crap square bales out the back end. Uh, and it was all done with horsepower. No. So if we were to have an SHTF thing, we're, uh, 
Do you think there'd be roads for it to go down, or you think we'd have to go over terrain? The roads, the... I was thinking there's no EMPs. There probably won't be too many EMPs. They'll probably just take out the infrastructure, which would be their, their highways and stuff. Without constant maintenance and with weather, and there's not going to be the traffic, so that's not going to be an issue. But with storms, uh, expansion, contraction, and see, it's actually some of the traffic on the road actually keeps the road in shape. Without the traffic on the road, the uh, asphalt they use actually has what's called a coal tar in it, which is a living tar. Not living, but it, it doesn't ever solidify. And as long as you're moving, the vibration keeps it shook down and stuck together. When you stop using the road, which happens here, the farm to markets that people don't drive down enough, the shoulders start crumbling and falling away. It's not cracking. The but without traffic, the road will literally crack and come apart. Yeah. And roads will only last about ten years after cars quit. When after ten years after the cars quit going up and down them, paved the asphalt roads are going to be near impassable. So you would need to, instead of uh, you would need vehicles to go that would go over land basically instead of these little foo foo cars they have now. People talk about uh, people never leaving their county of origin when they were, you know, in the nineteen hundreds or whatever. Uh, in the 1800s, in, in the 1800s, literally, if uh, you had been born in Lubbock County up there at Monterey, which there wasn't a Lubbock County, if you'd been born in Monterey, you were not going to, you weren't going to miraculously go visit a girl in Garza County, fall in love, and then drive back and forth and have date nights on Friday night and stuff. Chances of you ever knowing Garza County actually existed were near zero. It just didn't happen. You didn't have time for one thing. It's going to take you a week to get to, to post and back. Uh, if you were able to make the track to post and back, because there's nothing to drink between Love or Monterey, Texas, and post Texas. If, if you actually think about it, back when they did, when they was working buggy only or or the little man-made cars that were very first ones. <laughs> Nobody really over traveled over five or 10 miles anyway. Yeah. They tried to stay within five or 10 miles because it took them so long to traverse that far, you know? How yeah. often did trains have to stop? The steam, the steam engines, the steam trains that opened the West made it possible to go from one side of the country to the other side of the country in under two yeah. weeks. How often did they have to stop? They had to stop long enough to take on water. Yeah, how often was that? I don't know. You tell me. 20 what miles. Happens? It could take 20 miles. Every 20 miles? 20 miles, they had to stop and get water. 20 miles, they'd have to stop and get water. 20 miles, they'd have to stop and get water. The railways had uh, towns set up every 10 miles, 8 to 10 miles. So the, the trains could leapfrog and not have, they wouldn't stop at every town. They would stop and they, if they didn't carry, they couldn't carry extra water and pump it into the deal and make the run or whatever. They, uh, that's some of the reason the train tracks went where the train tracks went is because they had to have water. The, the train could not go without steam. Because the steam that's produced by the coal fire literally goes out the top. I mean, it's you don't get that water back. Yep, it evaporates. Yep. Uh, so it's. I've been doing a lot of research on the because I'm trying to find all the abandoned towns, which with uh, from Interstate 20 to I-25, uh, I've been able to locate. Uh, seven of the towns. There's still three missing. Okay, I don't know what she's talking about here, but uh, Lana is saying something about Centralia. 
Uh, with no traffic, you just have to look at Centralia to see what exactly will happen. I don't know what Centralia is. Uh, in fact, after a while, every city will look like Centralia once infra infrastructure is not repaired. I don't know what Centralia is. The only Centralia I know is in Washington. <laughs> but, but I will say this. If you live in any town, if you go on the alleys or the back roads or... <laughs> Like in my town, if you walk down the alleys, you can see where the where he's talking about the roads are cracking. They're not used uh, by traffic, so they they are cracking. They're coming apart. There's grass growing in the cracks, that kind of stuff. Uh, so yeah, it doesn't take long to. Yeah, uh, that's what I was getting at. You'd probably, you'd probably need some sort of vehicle that would be able to go cross yeah. country because the roads are going to be probably tore up or or taken out by some sort of war machine or whatever. Yeah. So you want something like a four wheel drive or maybe a army truck or a Humvee or something like that. What? And you would have to figure out how you're gonna make that thing go, you know? How, how are you gonna keep it going? I mean, realistically, are you gonna wanna be caught? I mean, short of like, you know, bombs going off and forcing you out of your, your you know, large local area right there. I mean, are you going to want to be bugging out or are you going to want to be, you know, staying where all the resources that you know are? Yeah. You know, obviously I said, if it's like cataclysm, you know, like a five or a 10 mile radius. Okay. They're saying it's a dead town in Pennsylvania. Uncle Al says it's a cold town. Uh, it was a town that was evacuated. Uh, okay. That's there. the one that has the underground coal fire that, they, that it'll never go out. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. The fire yeah. balloon. Okay. Okay. Uh, I call oh, I'm checking into this prepping and evacuating and bugging out stuff for... I've been playing around with this stuff since I was 14 years old. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, they're It's not, there's no perfect plan. You can't, yeah. you're not going to have the perfect vehicle. But if anybody wants to give me that Russian rescue, search and rescue vehicle, that big red sucker, I want that. Uh, <laughs> I yeah. think uh, you know, but then, then at the same time, you know, you know, a, a really good example of, of this, the perseverance and ingenuity of, of getting across the country. Look at the Mormons. Look at the the Mormons when they when they had the extermination proclamation put out against them back in the 1840s, and they were forced out of Illinois and they were forced out of Missouri, and they traveled you know 1,500 miles west across the Rockies into Salt Lake. Half of them did it with hand carts. The other half did it with oxen pulled covered wagons. It took them nine, ten months, and they. They, you know, they suffered great atrocity because of the the cold winters in Kansas and in and, and uh, in Nebraska and stuff. But they, there was a handcart company. They literally pulled handcarts with all of their stuff in the back. And so it it can be done by manpower if you have the drive to do so. But uh, that's it's going to be hard work and it's going to take a long time. You know, that's going to be the, the Lewis and Clark Expedition Great Adventure. So if you really want to, you know, research and see how it is to cross a, a, a wide stance in in a somewhat apocalyptic time, look at the Mormons that, that crossed the plains because they they were the epitome of having to run away from an atrocity and, and settle across this country. So. Well, they all did it like in the wagon trains and stuff, you know. Yeah. Some people had to walk it, you know. They would hook up with a wagon train or something, but they would actually walk it because they couldn't afford anything else, you know. They just had what they had on their backs, you know. A just human how being. Bad, how bad do you want, want it, you know. That's where it comes down to. A human yeah. being dragging a go-kart with his personal possessions, his family and his personal possessions could actually outpace <laughs> the wagon train. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because you have to stop and care for the stock all the time, you know, and it took, you know, a, a minimum of two oxen to pull a small covered wagon. 
and and to be able to maintain those beasts of burdens there's a reason that the oxen are, are extinct now you know like because they all died off because they got worked so hard so well and uh Will said, or Lou said, uh, we'll be all refugees on the highway pushing shopping carts. Well, here's the thing. Um, nowadays, we do have things like that. We have shopping carts. We have different types of, of uh, dollies and garden Bicycle. carts and stuff. Stuff that wasn't available in the 1800s. So it is going to be a little bit different in some ways, but in uh, some ways it's not it's you know we have more stuff like that available to us well but and, you know you think about a hand cart that has a five foot tall wheel a six foot tall wheel that's a much better you know gear ratio than a wheelbarrow or a scooter or a little go-kart or something like that so you're going to want to have really tall wheels to be able to lessen the burden a little bit something to consider if yeah. you are going to do the uh, the hand the hand uh pulled uh, apparatus there. Some pretty, uh, uh, pretty good engineered stuff. Yeah. Yeah, we're out there, you know, stuff. big wheels, little wheels, maybe carts with no wheels. You know, you just never know. There's going to be, oh, look what that guy come up with. Oh, shoot, look yeah. what Wes made. You know, that kind of stuff. You know, why didn't I think of that? Yeah. <coughs> and, you know, think about how long actual rubber tires last, you know. I mean, granted, uh, <coughs> forever lasting, they will shred and all that over time. But, you know, think of the things they could create using those that they couldn't do in the 1800s. So, yeah. It's, well, and that's why having some knowledge of being able to make wagon wheels, you know, being able to use a draw knife, a spoke shave, and, and being able to, uh, you know, make big wooden wheels like that is, is not a bad idea. So. Right. Because all the gas and stuff is going to disappear, you know, eventually, you know, you'll be able to use it for a while, but it's going to disappear fast. That's why I started out the whole evening with that idea of uh, veg, veg oil and stuff, because everything's going to disappear faster than you think it is. You're going to have to be thinking on your toes in order to get from point A to point B. I you personally, might I like, out, you might start out I like with the bicycle idea or, myself. You know, I think bicycles are about as good as it gets. With, with nothing but what's on your back. Just something to think about. I think there will be some uh, different, uh, unusual uh, vehicles <laughs> created. So I'm getting I'm getting my spaceship ready. <laughs> <laughs> no, I I like bicycles. I've got a little bike trailer that I that fits like two small children in it and it hooks up to the back of the bike and we can go, you know, I can ride comfortably 10, 15, 20 miles. It, it, which is another, you know, thing to consider, you know, you can you can clear a decent amount of of, of of ground on a bike especially with the roads and the sidewalks that you have in in, in all the towns across the the country here so so especially having bikes and having area. extra inner tubes and extra tires for your bikes is going to be uh, an invaluable resource so yeah those carriers can be improvised i was thinking about that i've been i've been looking into all kinds of stuff myself and i was thinking a bike with one of those carriers on the back because the bike's going to be stable you know because of the Shit, carrier, the, on you know, the, the, the trailer that really I have it says it can take up to 150 it. pounds, you know, so I could throw 150 pounds worth of stuff into the bike trailer. Obviously, I'm going to be going slow on, uh, you know, on on my single, you know, two leg power right there. But but if you can haul back some stuff, you know, and I see, you know, when I was in Salt Lake, you'd see homeless guys with their little trailers behind their bikes. And it would be like, you know, two and three hundred pounds of stuff just yeah. hanging off their 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 little rig right there. But they're making it happen. So, uh, you know, it's going to be a really good idea because you do have the infrastructure laid out to be able to uh, to, to run a bicycle easily enough without having to to bushwhack the whole time. So. One should make sure that their significant other is strong and healthy so that they can bear the load of toting all that stuff around for you. <laughs> well, I mean, but, yeah, in our situation, 
um, Angel and Brandon cannot ride bikes due to their uh, physical abilities. And, but they can ride a three wheel bike. So a trike. So those work too. <laughs> you know, like even, even if you, if you have roads and sidewalks, a razor scooter is an easy way to get around uh, without having to just walk. And, and you yeah. can fold that up and throw it on your backpack with all your su other stuff. If you're trying to go into market or trying to, you know, go and communicate with this or whatever, those little tiny razor scooters are also a, a decent idea to have if you're around a place that has roads and sidewalks. Yeah, I used a couple of skateboards one time to move a projection TV from one uh, street to another. <laughs> I just yeah. put them under and pushed the skateboards down the road. All meanie ha-has put aside, Sears and Roebuck, uh, and Western Auto and John Deere all put out a three-speed bicycle back in the 70s. I mean, I know what y'all know what I'm talking about, the three-speed bicycles. Not the ones you can get at Walmart, which they have a, a knockoff that you can buy at Walmart now. But if you can get your hands on one of the old three-speed bikes or whatever, mm -hmm. Dude, they had that. You could get that basket mount for the back or whatever. Yep. You could literally put it in low. You could walk up the hill, no problem. Put it high. You could zip down the other side. Nothing yeah. fancy. You can have all this stupid gears going clickety, clickety, clackety, clackety, jumping off or whatever. It was all, it was a literal transmission in the back tire. Freaking. Yep, I remember those, yep. Uh, I had one. <laughs> Well, you know, you could even get more ghetto than that and get your weed eater and get your welder out and just hook up your weed eater to your 10 speed right there and, and kind of have a, obviously not the same type, but you could, you know, work your gear ratios with your little weed eater to help assist the, uh, you know, weed eater motor hooked up to it to help assist the, the drive there. So I've had a hundred dollars. Hey, hey, Wes, Kaylin says he, she has a problem with something you said there. She says she can't, she doesn't know where. Who her significant oh. other is? Uh, that gummy, Caitlin, you're just going to have to go on a fit. You know how to make biscuits. What you do is you make a pan of biscuits and <laughs> you have some bacon and you sit down on the corner. And the first good, strong looking fella that walks by and stops and asks for a biscuit and some bacon, you throw a rope around him and there's your significant other. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you got that, Kayla. <laughs> for a brand, though, because that can be considered rustling in some states. Uh, it's kidnapping in others, but if the biscuits and bacon don't work, then you got the wrong guy anyway. <laughs> Take a cute dog to uh, to Home Depot with you and just walk around and talk to people until someone stops. <laughs> Oh man, I broke up with every cute dog girlfriend I ever got. I was like, oh no, not another one of those. Uh, uh, they got, uh, Rona has a, a good thing. She said that Kaylin can cook because she cooks at the mosque. <laughs> so she must be able to cook pretty good. There you go. Oh, uh, wait. Good be them different. Uh, can't use bacon. That gummy. Uh, I don't know. He said only Maybe beef or no pig. Hey, fry up a ribeye. There you go. <laughs> yeah. T-bone steak. It's on the menu, guys. <laughs> no bacon for Kaylin. Yeah, no pig. All right, guys. We're at the end. Hi, Howie. How are you tonight? Are there any other questions from the side chat? or? No. Nope. Hey, nope. FFP made it in. How are you doing? We covered everything that was in the chat. But what I was saying about the bicycle thing, I want this is actually kind of important. I know I've made it sound like a joke, but uh, for in a post whatever situation, you do not want to have to worry about them little tiny gears or them cables getting rusty or any of that stuff. Those the internal workings that are greased in their seals and the whole nine yards on those those three speed bicycles those flipping <laughs> things even if the cable breaks whatever gear it sticks in it usually goes to first you've still got your bicycle 
the you see the constables or whatever driving around all over the countryside in Europe and stuff. They're not riding just a regular bicycle. They're riding a three-speed bicycle. Little, little mopeds, essentially. So. Well, they have the mopeds, too. But uh, bicycles are a big thing everywhere but here. Because everywhere but here, you can literally get everything you need within 20 blocks of your home. There's, there's no bicycles reason. are probably a better way to go. But I'm not sure about the all-terrain part of it. <laughs> even if the even if there is some roads, the roads are going to be like you said; they're going to be broken up and everything. So there got to be times that you're walking your bike, and you can do like those guys. I watched a guy on here the other day rode off the top of a perfectly good mountain, and then was doing somersaults and stuff on his bicycle. I was an idiot. He must be kin to Bear Grylls or something. But, uh, no, I think, I really think that a guy could do a whole lot worse than just a, a, a straight chain bicycle. Because if something goes wrong with this part of the bicycle, if you just got a regular, regular three-speed or single-speed bike, there are literally billions of parts that are going to directly interchange with your bicycle everywhere. You can pull a shopping cart with your bicycle. To a degree, yeah. Uh, I built a, a bicycle cart when my kid was, my middle boy was two years old. And uh, I used to drag my kid, or ride, you know, ride my kids around. And then the next year you could buy them at Walmart. But, uh, the uh there you can drag about 50 pounds on a bicycle without it totally killing you uh, you got to remember whatever you put on that little cart behind you you have to pull yep that's for sure um how he brought up boats that's what i was waiting for yeah not just land transportation. You got to know how to do a canoe, small little John boat, row your way. There's a reason why most people don't I agree with that. I mean, why don't people go out kayaking, kayaking or canoeing? Because you literally, you if have you to can have to have a kayak that you can put together and just set your uh, your bicycle in the middle of it so you can pedal the kayak down the through the lake or whatever. Be something like Wes's uh, barrel barrel raft. Barrel kayak, yeah, yeah. Which I need to finish. That's why, people, that's why people stayed next to water. There, you know, a lot of their lives, a lot of the civilizations were next to water. It wasn't just for to drink. It was so you can move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You can drag fifty pounds around on your bicycle, or you can put a thousand pounds in your canoe and paddle it upstream. It's your choice. You got to have some pretty good shoulders, but. I mean, it's your choice. Well, if you're bugging out, you're probably going to stay like we talked about. You're probably going to stay within uh, 5 to 20 miles in the radius of you. So whatever you use, is, you're going to get good at whatever it is to use. Now, for me, I, I have to travel an hour in any direction to get to water. So, I mean, it's not, for me, it's not something i do often because it's so far away so i spent this entire day i spent seven and a half hours today logging every <coughs> body of water within 10 miles of my house that would float a boat i physically visited every one of those places today uh well that i could get there i was unable to find access to two of them uh, but that was my my goal for today. I mean, I literally, I don't know if y'all noticed, but I wasn't online all day. I went and, because uh, water's big here. I know where a lot of springs are. I know where uh, a lot of creeks are. One of the creeks that I thought was spring-fed, come to find out, it's a, uh, 
a guy has a three inch irrigation well that he pays the electric bill to keep water running in his creek. Uh. So it's not it's not even a real spring fed creek. Uh, so I mean, just because you see water somewhere in West Wind Survival, he went down to what was that river he went to the San Diego like, River. Oh, yeah, not drinking that crap. Uh, it's there's a creek here. It's uh, well, there's two, three, four, four. Uh, the I'm not drinking out of any, I don't care if I boil it, filter it, run it through reverse osmosis. I'm not drinking that water, um, because it's going to have antifreeze, motor oil, uh, everything that's washed out of the street in that town is going to be in those creeks. Everything. I tried uh, filtering some of that uh, chemically imbalanced water that was just in the street. Well, I can't remember. It's a couple of years ago now. I tried that filter thing with the charcoal and the sand and the rock and all that crap. And even though I did all that and boiled it, it still tasted like the chemical. I didn't drink it all. I just took a sip, threw the rest out. <laughs> well, it's like uh, there's a, some of the water got so sparse in this part of the world, they are actually recycling sewage here. Well, for drinking water or just for? Yes, for, they're, they're injecting it into the drinking supply. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah. They're running it through a treatment deal, running it through a stand tank. Um, they put it in this big lake, is what they're calling it, uh, reservoir. And then they pump it from that reservoir, uh, they pump it 48 miles, and then run it through another filter system, chlorinating system, and then pump put it into the drinking supply. I was like, no, I mean... Uh, every time somebody takes a uh, prescription medication, the part of the prescription medication that they don't sweat out. Uh, you guys right? are going to be like Flint, Michigan, huh? It's, uh, I mean, people are going to start growing horns and like having four livers and like six nostrils and well, actually probably they're all probably just going to start swelling up and dying. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's stuff like that. I mean, that's uh, just because the water looks clear. My water's pretty. My well water is pretty. If you hold it up, I mean, it looks like pure water. Don't Have you got a deep well or a shallow well? Uh, I have uh, the. When they drill the well, they took it off. They took uh, they took the forty foot. The 120 foot, the 160 foot, and the 280 water. It all goes into the same hole. Uh, the water level stays at or between uh, 168 and 140, depending on how much I use it in my well. I have a, a six inch hole to keep. Uh, enough head pressure on my well to keep it going right or whatever i have my pump set at 220. And that's way more information than y'all need to, but there you go. <laughs> well i'm not that's the only reason i asked was because if it's a shallow well you could be getting some of that uh yeah exactly water into it you know that's uh that's that's the thing uh the uh the dumb ground uh, they actually have a water line running from a city water line that supplies a, another community 20 miles away for the water going into their office. They don't even use the water well, one of the four water wells that they have on their property to flush their own toilets. <laughs> what did that tell you? <laughs> <laughs> so... Uh -oh. yeah. 
And it's going on everywhere. They've already killed another 150, 200 springs in the area with the water wells. Yeah, it's going to be Flint, Michigan in, in your town pretty soon. Oh, it's, uh, it's going everywhere. When uh, the, our current population is unsustainable, our, the probably how they plan on doing a population control. Well, either the either they kill us or we kill ourselves. The, the we can't <laughs> can't do it. There's you know, if we were all growing our own food, if we all had our own little ten acres and there was 10 people on each 10 acre plot and we were all working together to grow our own food and make our own clothes and stuff like that. If we were all literally working together so we could all eat and be fat and be sheltered and stuff, it worked. But uh, everybody wanting their own smartphone, their own four bedroom, three bath house, it, we can't do it. There's not, there's not enough resources on the planet. Yeah. There's not. All right, I think we're wrapped up here, guys. Did anybody got anything in the side chat? Uh, there was just one question about the, the dams and locks, but I think that kind of, if it's a worst case scenario, no one's gonna man them. They're pretty much gonna do like everything else and just fall apart. So that, it was quite a ways back. Uh, they're just basically talking about just different things to do with water talking about the water yeah yeah all right you guys tell everybody good night night everybody see you later guys if anybody needs to prep water i sell dehydrated water, <laughs> water bag, all you gotta do is add water and it'll fill up i promise <laughs> He's gonna sell it to you out of the city water system. My wife gives me a gallon of dehydrated water every year for my birthday. So there you go. That's true. All right. Good night, guys. Good night.